So um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Michelle, and this is uh, Joe. We are from uh, Facebook's uh, client platform engineering team, also CPE, not the community platform. <laughs> Naming is hard, right? And there are so many, not enough uh, TLAs to go around. So the talk, this talk is going to be about how um, we manage our Fedora desktop fleet at Facebook and why we are managing uh, the client fleet. So <clears throat> this is the agenda. Uh, first, why we want to manage our client devices and then why it's actually hard to manage uh, client devices as opposed to managing servers. Uh, and then we'll give an overview of what our fleet look like and how we manage them. And then we want to talk about, this is the most interesting part, um, how we want to actually uh, collaborate with um, the federal community to actually work on things we both care about and things that we um, care about as well. <coughs> so why? Um, user experience. Facebook is a big company. We onboard a lot of people every week, and we want the experience to be good, right? You come in, you get a new laptop, everything should be set up for you automatically. Or after a few years, you get, uh, you replace your device. Um, everything should, um, anything that you need to work and be productive should be there for you. <clears throat> Developer access. Uh, Facebook um, has a lot of uh, internal tools that we build ourselves. We want to make it easy for the teams that actually write these tools to be able to um, write them, package them, deploy them, and have them work out of the box on the, on the teams that actually need to use them. <clears throat> security. Um, I mean, like, um, there are some security standards we have to maintain, right? If, um, like, I'm um, setting up uh, full disk encryption, making sure that um, if someone loses a device, we can actually wipe the device for them making sure that security uh, updates are applied automatically. And auditability, we want to make it so that um, when people um, make configuration changes, they are actually um, tracked somewhere. So, um, so we know what setting is being applied on any device. And also why it's hard. It's hard because uh, the desktop client is not, um, it's not a server. There's a person sitting in front of the keyboard. Um, so there are things that uh, you can do that would be like uh, breaking someone's flow. You cannot assume that um, you don't want to say like um, run something that's CPU intensive and then like uh, someone's compile job becomes uh, much slower. <coughs> Desktops are not connected all the time. Uh, so, and we cannot manage the desktop when it's offline. It's also hard to actually um, Always make sure that you can um, remote into a, into a machine to troubleshoot if there's an issue. And those are just a general challenge. We have uh, Facebook specific challenges as well. Uh, we are really big on IPv6, uh, partly because we are such a huge company. And some things don't work so well in IPv6 because um, nobody else actually has an IPv6 only environment. Uh, we'll get to the details later. And then this is uh, similar to what uh, Matt talked about earlier today, uh, that Fedora is too fast and too slow at the same time for some people. We have some teams with um, unique needs that always um, say, oh, we want to be on the older release for a bit longer. And they keep getting nagged by GNOME software. Hey, there's a new Fedora available. Do you want to upgrade? And the teams that, um, the people that support those teams are complained to us, saying, um, can we turn off this update notification because when they upgrade, our tooling don't work. Teams that um, have either third-party tools or funky hardware, and by funky, I normally mean NVIDIA. And then training. Um, before we uh, choose to standardize on Fedora for our Linux users, this is even more of a serious issue because um, Imagine you are a help desk technician, you are hired and you're told, hey, uh, most people here use Macs. So we hire from, say, um, we hire those Apple geniuses. And then someone comes in and say, my Arch Linux cannot connect to Wi-Fi. So it's, um, 
it's getting better, but it's also getting worse because now when you tell them like, hey, um, uh, Fedora is a supported platform, and now people go there and they have the expectation that um, it's supported, right? So you know everything to make this work. So we are not a majority Linux company at the desktop. Our servers are mostly Linux, but not our desktops. Most people use Mac OS or Windows. So it's an interesting experience, right? Like um, if we get Fedora right, we are going to see uh, more uptake, hopefully. So in the past, um, we don't actually, um, some people want to run Linux on their desktops and they uh, come to our team and they say, um, can you support it? And we didn't set a direction, so we let people uh, pick whatever they are most familiar with. So our Linux users are, were mostly on Ubuntu. And then there's a vocal uh, community that uses Arch. This is not officially supported, so we find that in our experience, people will contribute the minimum amount of fixes that they need to actually get what they need to work actually working. So, and after that, they just throw it away and like, uh, they don't touch the code anymore. So it's a bit of a nightmare. So last year, we decided to uh, standardize and uh, pick Fedora. And multiple reasons. One of them is that we already um, run CentOS on our server fleet. So we have all the expertise to actually um, deal with RPMs and everything. Um, because we use CentOS, um, there's already a lot of uh, internal infrastructure needed to support it, like how to build RPMs, how to actually deploy them. So for, in for instance, a lot of our uh, internal tools, like um, we have a um, slightly modified version of Mercurial that's um, shipped as an RPM. Um, and the same package can be used on both our server and our desktops. So this is uh, the view of our client fleet um, over the past year or so. Um, as you can see, like, uh, we finally became a Fedora majority. Uh, the desktop fleet became mostly Fedora earlier this year. And this is the adoption curve um, for different federal versions. So um, it's normally quite easy to persuade people on ThinkPad laptops to uh, ship, switch to the latest federal version as soon as they are released. Uh, the people who are lagging behind, as you can see, um, Fedora 28 dropped um, precipitously uh, pretty much around the time that um, it uh, reached end of life, but not before. Those are the people on workstations with NVIDIA. We have to nag them and nag them and say, like, hey, come on, you have to actually uh, move away from this. And yeah, uh, we still need to get better at actually um, forcing people off um, unsupported releases because as you can see, um, Fedora 27 actually has active usage months after it was end of life. When I reached out to one of them, he said, oh, I didn't know it's end of life. Um, so that's pretty much what um, our fleet looked like. Um, I'm going to um, hand it over to Joe now for how we actually manage our desktop fleet. Hello. Uh, my name is Joe Cholko. I work uh, with Michelle on the client platform engineering team. Um, I primarily work on Mac OS, but they let me play with the cool kids in the Linux pod sometimes too. Um, in, like you mentioned, uh, the, some of the difficulties in, in managing client uh, platforms um, can be pretty unique. Uh, for instance, imagine any one of your servers could go to sleep in San Francisco and wake up in Budapest and then expect to connect and uh, update all of its configurations. Um, and each machine has a unique snowflake sitting at the keyboard um, who may be part of a group of uh, similar snowflakes. And so, uh, Many of the configurations that we make, um, we, we build them to be um, configurable down to the machine or uh, user setting. Um, and to do this, uh, we use uh, Chef for our configuration management. Um, and at Facebook, we use a, a specific uh, API model um, with Chef, which is a, deviates a little bit from the, the core Chef tools in that um, uh, we can then uh, 
set a, a base config for the fleet and then allow um, end users themselves to update um, certain portions of that configuration for their own machines. Uh, Chef uh, runs in a declarative way. Um, and the, the run list in Chef is uh, um, by design in order. Um, so we take advantage of that um, run list order to be able to make changes as, the, uh, as Chef proceeds through its run. Um, Chef actually does a few um, different loops through all of the, uh, the cookbooks. Um, it loops through everything to compile all of the settings into a node object and then it loops back through to execute on the resources. And so we can take advantage of that um, as the compile phase runs and, cha and make changes to that configuration based on groupings, username, serial number, um, network, uh, any sorts of criteria that we might want to use. Um, in the, uh, the lazy evaluation is another way that we can um, delay uh, configurations that are to be applied to resources at the end of the chef run. Uh, the API model, like I said, is um, kind of a specific Facebook thing that we use chef in, in the way that we use chef. We manage uh, the platform, um, but by default, all of the settings are either going to be nil or false. And then as the chef run proceeds, um, we start filling in um, those configs. Like I said, we can, we can say for the entire fleet, you'll get one setting. And then as that, um, the chef compiles, the process moves along, then maybe a specific group updates one of the settings. And then by the time the resources run, they apply what is specific for that machine. Um, and we also uh, promote user choice um, in that most of the, any of the API settings that we have in Chef can be changed um, by individual developers themselves. Um, and everything goes through change control, um, source control pro process, uh, peer review. So um, anybody who wants to make a change to their system um, can get somebody else to sign off on it. Um, and you know, perhaps maybe a security review as well. Um, and because everything is in source control, it's all auditable, so we know that you, as an individual, made a change to your specific machine, um, and then they can track back and, and uh, look at the notes and see why that was done. An example for here is a screensaver, and this is a good example because it's cross-platform. Um, Chef is platform agnostic, so we can um, run the same resource on Mac OS and Windows and Linux, um, and the the uh, underlying uh, resource will take care of the platform-specific um, code to make those changes. So we can set a default value of true and a max idle time of five minutes, which is mean, probably. Uh, do we do that? That's awful. Uh, <laughs> and then um, when the uh, resource runs, it, it uh, knows what platform it's on, and so it runs the specific um, calls to the APIs to make that screensaver change in this example. Um, and again, um, we can set that default to five minutes, but somebody may say, no, I need it to be 10 minutes. Um, and they can go in and uh, make that change. And then in the chef run here, you see halfway down, it's changing. Um, it's actually going from 10 minutes to, to five minutes there. Um, but it detects that the, the initial base setting um, that we set for the corporate fleet was 10 minutes in this example, um, but this user decided they wanted to be five. Um, another example was uh, password policy. Um, and again, it's a cross-platform uh, recipe and cookbook within Chef that can run on all of our platforms. And uh, the individual users um, could potentially uh, make changes to their own policy. In this instance, it probably would want, we would want it to go through some sort of security review as well. And again, the uh, um, setting the, the policy on the resource level is platform specific, um, whereas defining uh, these settings is platform independent. Thanks, Joe. So one of the things we have a um, serious problem with is um, back, um, running package operations. Uh, it's not so bad on Fedora. Ubuntu is way worse because uh, by default, you, the first time you log into a desktop, starts um, running this update application that tried to um, 
update the repo and tell you how many updates there are. Um, but basically, um, uh, by default, Chef basically encourages you to actually use their package resource to actually say, hey, I want uh, this RPM to be installed. And imagine if you have 20 cookbooks and each cookbook has five recipes, and each of them basically say, I want to install something. You have 100 package operations going on. Each of them can basically be blocked because like, oh, someone is holding the YAM lock, help. So what we do is like, we have a two-prong approach. We find that in the past, a lot of tool authors basically have um, over-optimistic assumption about how useful the tool is. So they'll say like, hey, yeah, I'm going to install this tool um, on 20,000 Macs or like on all the like 500, say, federal machines. And then we find that it's not actually being used that much. So we can move them to um, being installed on demand. So we can say, hey, uh, we are going to drop a start installer for you. And when the user actually invoked the tool, we say, oh, hang on a minute. You actually um, let me install the tool for you. Uh, the other thing we do is instead of um, telling people, uh, instead of um, every um, recipe actually running a package installation, we encourage people to use our API and say, tell us what you want to install. We'll have a batch job that uh, we configure with systemd. And it will come along every um, one hour and say, like, um, oh, these are the packages that need to be installed. Uh, let me run a single transaction and make sure they're all installed. <coughs> so um, here comes the exciting part. Um, what we actually want, um, need help with from the community and also want to contribute back on. Um, I tried to use the Fedora and the Facebook uh, colors for this. Um, Kind of hard because they are both really, really similar colors. So um, on the left part is what um, some of the federal initiatives. On the right side is um, what we care about. And as you can see, there's a lot of overlap. Um, we run workstation on our, um, on our um, client fleet. We are, we, might cut, uh, cut. we are looking at silver blue and see whether it might be a good fit. Um, it depends on what we can do with containers. One of the roadblocks is that there are a lot of things that we manage at the system level. Like we manage certificates, we manage monitoring tools, that those might be a bit difficult to replicate. Uh, we want to get better at QA both on our end and also on the helping Fedora uh, with their uh, CI initiatives. One of the problems we used to have uh, in the past is um, we continuously install, um, do network installations of Fedora every week. <coughs> In the past, we um, actually install them with updates enabled. And what we find is that every Fedora release, there will be a post-release update that accidentally broke uh, network installation. Sometimes we uh, discovered it. Sometimes uh, we find that um, someone already reported it. So we ended up switching to actually say, let's do an installation without updates. So at least we know that once it works, it will keep working. And then like, we apply security updates when we start configuring the machines. But that's a bit not ideal. Um, GNOME software, there's a lot of uh, feature requests we would like to um, make and also maybe help implement. Um, server and CoreOS, we probably don't, um, are not looking at that now. Uh, and then there's the Facebook specific issues. Um, IPv6, which we can probably uh, contribute uh, fixes for. and how to deal with NVIDIA hardware, which is probably um, sort of in scope, but out of scope because I guess Fedora cannot really um, solve it. So some tools we care about. Um, Network Manager, um, we have problems with this uh, in some of our newer offices where uh, we only deploy IPv6. And we find that uh, Network Manager doesn't actually finish setting up a connection, both uh, Wi-Fi connection and VPN if it couldn't actually get a DHCP uh, v4 release, you just get confused and say you don't actually have a connection. Uh, we opened a bug a few months ago, but I guess, um, yep, <laughs> not enough people working on it. Uh, GNOME software, there are, we have some issues uh, with um, package management uh, in general anyway. Uh, one is that, as I said earlier, uh, GNOME software will tell you uh, there's a, new release coming up, and we couldn't find a way to actually uh, turn it off. 
So for our user base that need to stay on Fedora 29, uh, the only solution we could find is basically disable GNOME software altogether. Except then there are other issues that happen. If you actually um, try to run a tool that's not installed, by default it will try to actually ask GNOME software to install it, and that just fails, saying like, oh, I don't know what uh, actually runs this uh, debug service. Uh, ideally, we, we can, that's tunable, and also we, we can actually keep GNOME software for managing flat packs and firmware updates, but not for RPMs. Uh, version locking. We use uh, DNF automatic to apply uh, security updates. We find that by default it doesn't actually um, honor the um, version locks that we have um, in, in the uh, version lock uh, plugin. So we have to basically configure um, Chef to actually say, hey, when someone say they want to lock a version, uh, exclude it from uh, DNF automatic so it doesn't get updated. And again, GNOME software because um, it has its own RPM backend, so we have PackageKit and a DNF, and PackageKit also doesn't understand um, version locking the same way that uh, DNF does. And GNOME Keering. Um, currently, I was told by our security team that uh, GNOME Keering doesn't actually speak TLS 1.3, and there's a feature request that's been out for a while. On the process side, we um, we want to do better QA, both internally on the Facebook side and also um, participating in um, Fedora's QA process, both for package updates and for distribution upgrades. And this is kind of like a reach, but ideally um, if we can help push uh, vendors like uh, Lenovo to actually um, certify Fedora or CentOS out of the box for their machines, that will really, really help us. Because right now it seems that any vendor that says they support Linux means they have some special Ubuntu build. Um, NVIDIA, I mean, um, if, I'm not sure what um, is, there are some Fedora developers helping NVIDIA actually uh, improve their tooling, right? So we need to talk. So yeah, uh, that's our presentation. Um, so we'll just open up um, questions, anyone? Um, so I'll, I'll repeat the question and then answer them. Uh, the first question was whether we can dedicate uh, resources to actually help um, Fedora on the desktop. And the answer is sort of maybe. Um, so to put a picture, uh, we have a team of 12 people. We manage uh, three OSs and, um, and two uh, mobile operating systems. So in real realistically, we have uh, two people, two or three people working full-time on uh, Linux. And not by full-time, I mean we also manage other things as well. So, um, but yeah, I mean, like uh, this is one of the things that's uh, blocking us. So, and Facebook internally sort of work as, um, as a community anyway. And um, sometimes people do things to scratch their own itch. That's not really part of their team's um, main work. So we might be able to find some volunteers who also like, um, you know, like, uh, find this important and help fix it. But otherwise, yeah, we, we do have some manpower dedicated for this, but I would say it's kind of probably on the order of a few hours a week instead of uh, someone actually working full time on the tool. Uh, the next question was uh, how to handle package operations um, if there are conflicts. Uh, we find that the Fedora default right now works for us. I mean, like, uh, 
by default, it will just fail, right? And it will say, oh, I cannot actually satisfy this operation. And at least it doesn't leave the system in an inconsistent state. Uh, in that case, um, since we are trying to move um, inside Facebook, oh yeah. Um, so apparently, what what Fedora what DNF does is um, it will skip packages that cannot be installed, but will do everything else. So yeah, actually that would work for us since um, we are trying to shift to a place where we actually say um, we run one batch job that can solve everything we care about. It's preferable if um, if as much as possible actually uh, runs. Um, sorry, do you mean um, whether we actually allow people to run non-English uh, locals? Um, yeah, we, we have no policy on that. So basically, um, I'm pretty sure users outside of the US actually um, set their machine to, um, to their own locals. Ah. Um, for our Linux users, most of them are probably, um, I cannot give specific numbers, but most of them will be in the US, uh, the UK, and Ireland. So it's probably going to be mostly English anyway. Uh, I would say high hundreds, and we hope to get into thousands sometime soon. Oh, sorry, yes, uh, how big is our uh, user population? Uh, so the question is whether we actually collaborate with our server team, and the answer is yes. Um, actually, um, these are the two repositories uh, that we open source. The first one is managed by the server team. The second one is the one we manage. We actually um, try to reuse as much of their tooling and cookbooks as possible. So the question is whether um, our users have root and whether they can actually um, run other desktops. And the answer is yes to both. So we, we have some system monitoring tools um, running, but uh, we also don't want to disallow people from doing whatever they want. So we have some people on KDE. We have some people on um, i3 is quite popular. One snag is that we make this assumption that um, people have GNOME installed. So if people the further people stray away from that, the more they might have to do things for themselves. Uh, yeah, uh, everyone basically, yeah, everyone has root access. One of the um, weirder outages we had was actually uh, when someone actually installed uh, Spotify through Snap on their desktop, and I'm not sure what happened there, but somehow like, um, they had a partition mounted over ETC and shadowing some of our files. That was fun. Yeah, we tried to increase uh, Flatpak as much as possible because it doesn't have that issue. Um, so, yeah, uh, what, are the big, some of, what are some of the biggest issues we've had with uh, Fedora on the desktop? Uh, one of them is um, people who basically um, really prefer CentOS or something like Ubuntu LTS. And so they complain about um, having to upgrade at least once a year. 
and NVIDIA hardware support is another big issue. Um, so I find that, yeah, it's mostly the same people uh, in both uh, situations. So they find that when they upgrade from Fedora 29 to 30, um, for some reason, Plymouth is broken for them and it doesn't uh, display the graphical um, splash screen for unlocking your, uh, your hard disk. And then they say, oh, we cannot use Fedora 30 because uh, we want that shiny thing. So yeah, it's a lot of, the problem is that, um, so to replicate their setup, we basically need to have one of their uh, workstation, try to install like uh, that exact setup, and basically uh, there's a lot of unpleasantness uh, to do with uh, binary packages. I mean, part of the reason they cannot upgrade as soon as Fedora comes out is also because the NVIDIA drivers might not be ready. Um, in the ballpark, I would say um, probably maybe about one third. It's basically our desktops. Oh, sorry. Um, how many, what's the percentage of our fleet that actually has NVIDIA hardware? And the answer is all the desktops. Uh, question is, uh, do we work with Fedora, uh, with NVIDIA to, in, uh, to improve Fedora support? It's, it's an ongoing process. We are trying to get them to um, at least certify centers on, um, on their server models. So, um, like, uh, is it really, really desktop? Yeah, uh, it's actually um, workstations that, you know, like, um, Lenovo voting stations sitting on, under, under someone's desk. Oh, sorry, yeah, the question was when I, when I say desktop, do I actually mean desktop or I just mean like a client machine? Uh, the question is, uh, what's the process uh, for fixing an issue if um, there's a bad uh, package going out or there's a bad configuration? And the answer is, um, so we have monitoring, so we can actually see, like, hey, of all our chef runs, um, what are the top errors at the moment? And most of the time, we can basically just uh, fix it uh, by making a commit, and eventually the next chef run should fix it. Uh, Sometimes there are cases where um, something really bad goes wrong, and like, um, either like a chef stops working, um, or we, we have an out-of-band remediation that basically try to actually um, uh, fix Chef and run it manually. Uh, but in the worst case, we basically, um, that's why we have uh, help desks. So we can tell the user, hey, go to the help desk and they will help you. Um, question is whether we have uh, user support. So we, it's probably similar to um, Ask Fedora. We basically, um, we have an official support. Um, so basically, for platforms we actually support, um, we promise that we will actually uh, get to someone and answer their questions. We try to make sure they go to the help desk first because uh, that way it scales better. Um, for, people, for people who use uh, Ubuntu or uh, Arch Linux, uh, those are technically not really supported, so we encourage the community to actually um, help each other. Hmm. Uh, good question. Um, we, sorry, uh, yeah, the question was, um, whether we support multi-user environments? And the um, answer is uh, no. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a bit simpler that way. We have, yeah. Yeah, um, I would say the average user probably has one point something uh, machines. Yeah, uh, some of our user population like uh, keep uh, asking for this as well because they say, hey, um, we have expensive workstations and can we share this please? Uh, but our security team configure things in a way that it's actually hard to do this. I mean, we want to make sure that if something goes wrong, we can actually trace it back to one person. And if there are multiple people on the machine, it's hard to actually um, 
for someone to be accountable. Um, so behind. Hmm. Uh, good question. Uh, question is uh, whether since NVIDIA doesn't really have a good track record of working with the Linux community, are we considering AMD? Um, the answer is yes and no. Some of our teams, unfortunately, are wedded to uh, CUDA, so it's going to be really hard to uh, proceed them to switch. But from the desktop fit, uh, we are actually really excited by um, uh, Lenovo actually bringing out a ThinkPad uh, T-Series with uh, AMD uh, GPU. So we might basically um, just basically uh, start supporting it and see whether it uh, works or not. Uh, next question was from someone on this side. Yep. Uh, that's a good question, and um, and we should have put that in the slides, actually. Um, so the question was, uh, how do we do phased rollouts, and how do we actually uh, make sure that if uh, something breaks early, we actually uh, don't continue the rollout? Uh, the question is, uh, yes, we do, and um, it's up to the person doing the rollout. Um, so basically, um, you can gate, you can configure when you want a package to go out, um, who actually gets it first. Uh, so you can say, hey, I want people. So for our own updates, we normally say, we are going to dog food it first, if it works. Um, if it's a Linux update, we, we have an early adopter uh, group. Um, and we push it to them and like, um, get, a, uh, get their feedback. And after that, it's basically just a sharded rollout. A sharded rollout, so we basically comp compute a hash of your, from your machine ID and gives you a shard from 0 to 99 and then say like, oh, let's do 5% of the population, let's do 15%. Um, question is whether we force updates and how. Um, we don't, which is why if you can see uh, from our adoption curve, uh, it's kind of lagging. We nag people to update. so. Not so much when a new version of Fedora comes out, because hey, if you want to be on 29, GNOME software is already nagging you anyway. Uh, we nag people starting one month before Fedora goes end of, uh, end of release, and we start nagging more and more aggressively about two, uh, two weeks before end of life. Yeah, we are, yeah, if, even if anyone has uh, experience basically forcing people to update, uh, we really want to hear from that. <laughs> The uh, question is how people upgrade, um, and the answer is um, we support both upgrade paths. So some people upgrade from uh, GNOME software, some people upgrade from uh, DNF. Uh, so um, if people want to actually reimage Fedora, um, so what happens because we have to bootstrap all our tooling, they need to actually be on a specially whitelisted uh, network VLAN. So people try not to do that because then they, they, need, um, they need to go to the hub desk to do it. So I don't want to keep people away from lunch. So any other question? No? All right, thank you. <laughs>